Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our program, Permit by Rule PBR Process for Solar and Energy Storage Projects in Virginia. My name is Brad Nowak. I'm a partner and co-chair of the Energy Practice Group at Williams Mullen, based in its Tyson's Virginia office. Also joining us remotely is my partner, Bob Riley, co-chair of our Energy Practice Group, also based in Tyson's Virginia. We're very pleased to be joined this morning by our special guests, Susan Tripp and Amber Foster with Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. Susan and Amber are small renewable energy permit by rule PBR coordinators within DEQ's Air and Renewable Energy Division. Susan has worked for DEQ for the past 12 years in their central office in Richmond. She started as a data analyst in the air permitting program and transitioned to her current role as a PBR coordinator in 2021. Susan holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Fairmont State University. And now Bob will introduce Amber. Thanks, Brad. We're pleased to have Amber Foster here today. Amber is one of the two small renewable energy permit by rule coordinators with DEQ. Amber started her position in June of 2022 with the small renewable group. Amber's primary role includes reviewing renewable energy PBR applications and drafting and issuing permit authorization letters, as well as assisting with development and maintenance of associated regulations, guidance, and procedures to implement the program. Before working with the Small Energy Group, Amber worked for DEQ with two other, in two other uh, capacities, most recently as the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act, locality liaison for the Hampton Roads region and Eastern Shore. And prior to that, Amber was with the title, State Title V Air Permitting uh, Group Coordinator. Amber, Amber it has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Roanoke College and a Master's of Science degree from Virginia Commonwealth University. Now, let me pass it back to Brad for a few housekeeping matters. Brad? Thanks, Bob. Before we kick off today's program, um, we just have a few things to go over. Um, at any point during today's presentation, you may submit questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if, we, if we don't have time to answer your question today, we'll respond by email afterward. If you're having any audio or technical problems, please also use that same Q&A button and it will help get those resolved. And lastly, you'll we'll receive a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation by email. Um, before I pass it to Amber, I uh, just want to mention that this is our third installment of our Renewable Energy webinar series. If you missed our two other webinars, we have the recordings and the PowerPoints on our website. And we have several other webinars uh, in the course of the next couple months. On May 3rd, we're holding a webinar on environmental considerations when studying and permitting renewable energy projects. On June 6th, we're going to have a webinar on renewable energy, real estate options and leases. And finally, um, on a day to be announced, we're gonna have a webinar on certificates, certificates of public convenience and necessity. Uh, so be on the lookout for invitations for those webinars. So now I'd like to pass the program off to Amber. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Bob and Brad, for having us here today. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity. And with that, we'll start with our slides. Next slide, please. Um, just an overview of what we're gonna go through. Um, our role, DEQ's role in the renewable energy permitting process, um, the overview of the Virginia regulations associated with the renewable energy PBR, what to anticipate in a PBR process, you know, from start to finish, practical tips for those applicants to successfully navigate the PBR process, and follow, finish up with some recent PBR developments and activity that are going on. Next slide, please. So just starting off, DEQ issues uh, permits for renewable energy projects. A lot of you probably already know this. Um, basically, it's a generation capacity of 5 to 150 megawatts alternating current. Um, to date, as of, I guess, yesterday, actually, this number is wrong. I just um, <laughs> added another permit to this 164 that have actually been permitted. Um, we have 165 facilities in the state that have been permitted through the PBR process, the small renewable energy PBR process. Um, you can see that's now a little bit over 4,700 megawatts and over 54,000 acres uh, associated with those projects. 
couple of fun facts. Um, one megawatt on average powers about 150 to 210 homes. Of course, that depends on where you are in the country. Some places are warmer, some places are colder, what time of year it is, but anyway. Personally, I like to have that kind of information in, you know, in mind when I'm working on some of these projects, just to kind of get an idea of what's what's out there. Um, let's see, did I have the same? Hmm, I put the same fun fact twice, so I guess I thought it was really fun. It was double fun. <laughs> <laughs> and real quick, Emily, um, I wanted to point out, because you have it in your notes here, in, that number of 164 facilities includes permits um, issued under section 30 and also 130. Um, so if that number seems rather high, uh, if you're looking at our data out on our website, um, the ones that have gone through the full PBR process, I think we have about 83 or four, 84 of those issued permits. Um, so just wanted to, to point that out. And that information is um, updated weekly um, out on our uh, DEQ's website. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. This is just a screenshot of what you can actually download from DEQ's website. Um, these show you those 164 facilities, um, or 165. And the only thing that's missing from this are there two storage projects. One is in Dan city of Danville, and the other is in Accomack County. We are working with our GIS department to bring in the ability to show you that other renewable energy type of project. So in the works, but anyhow, you can go and find this information online through deq. www.deq.virginia.gov. If you go to our um, DEQ's home webpage, there um, is a GIS portal. Um, you can access this information here. Um, this data set can be downloaded. And there's also an attribute table if you wanted to just download um, the various features um, associated with this data. Um, and then if you look under at the top of the website under the navigation tab, so if you go under air, you'll see renewable energy and there are resources um, available under those pages um, with this information. Next slide, please. So DEQ's role regarding renewable energy permitting, we are permitting anything below 150 megawatts. Anything larger is going to the State Corporation Commission. However, applicants may choose to go through the process with the SCC if you know they don't they aren't required to go through us. There is the option to do the permit with the SCC. Um, and I just want to put a note here what DEQ does not have the authority to do is to decide where these solar projects are going to be cited. That's a local land use decision. Um, we have projects that go through the local boards, board of supervisors, planning commission, et cetera, prior to the application coming to DEQ. So all that happens prior to us getting the application. Next slide. We do have a question. Are you okay with questions sure. that pertain? Um, so there's a question here that says, if you're trying to build a project that's larger than 150 megawatts AC, do you have to split up the projects, say 150 AC and 150, uh, and then obtain separate permits? Actually, um, under our regulations, that is not allowed. Um, we cap at 150, and it's based on an um, interconnection agreement. So if you were to have multiple interconnection agreements, um, and depending on the proximity of those projects, it could be permitted through us, but if it is um, truly 250 megawatts um, with a single interconnection agreement, then that one would be required to go through the State Corporation Commission. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So we have two types of um, renewable energy permits we're gonna focus on today, solar and energy storage. First slide here is just showing you what thresholds are in place for the section 30 versus the section 130. Section 130 are those, the ones that those of you familiar with it, it's a real quick process. You know, it's greater than 500 kilowatts, but less than five, less than or equal to five megawatts. Um, and your disturbance zone is specified as such. Next slide, please. What we are, what, you know, requires the most effort and time is the section 30 project. When I say section 30, I'm referring to the section in the Virginia Administrative Code for, in this case, solar. Um, and down the line here, we'll look at energy storage as well. 
this is just a reference slide. I don't, I'm not gonna read everything here, but these are the 15 requirements that are listed in the, um, the regulation that when an applicant submits their application, these are all the things we're looking for. Next slide, please. This is just, again, a quick reference slide. This is what we're looking for for the Section 130 application requirements. You can see the list is a lot shorter um, and much easier process. Next, next slide, please. And I would like to take a moment to point out if, if you are a developer or owner of a project that fits this criteria, and perhaps you weren't aware of this project, of this um, regulation, um, there wouldn't be any compliance or enforcement if you were to complete the paperwork and submit it to DEQ to get your project, um, to get your PBR authorization letter under section 130. Um, it, we really want to have that information. Um, the, the data that we gather is used by a lot of different agencies um, and other organizations throughout the state of Virginia to try to track the, um, you know, the progress of where Virginia is with solar energy. So um, you can contact Amber or I afterward if, if that's something that we could talk about. <laughs> the other um, permit type we're looking at today is energy storage. This is, there's actually three levels in this regulation. There's the section 30, which refers to the bigger projects. There's the section 120, which is the hybrid project. You could have renewable energy, you know, solar plus energy storage or wind plus en energy storage. And then there's the section 130, which refers to those smaller projects. Um, just as a note, the energy storage section 130 application requirements are actually a little bit more involved than the solar section 130. Next slide, please. Again, just a reference slide. Um, as you guys get copies of this and you just want to refer back to it, of course, you always have the regulation to look at as well. Next slide, please. Um, same thing, another reference slide, section 130, energy storage. You can see this list is a little bit longer than what we saw for solar. Just want to point that out. So when you're pre-planning, thinking about what you need to do, it's different than solar. And I would like to interject there because the benefits even though this says section 130 and most people with our other programs refer to that as de minimis, the thought process behind this with energy storage is when looking at an energy storage project, um, realizing that it has a much smaller environmental footprint. So I believe that this is for 10 acres or less. So um, most, we anticipate that most energy storage projects would fall under section 130. And if you're looking at what's listed here under these bullet points, you'll notice that there is no review that's conducted with the sister agencies, DHR, DCR, and DWR, because we're not looking at, uh, we're, we're looking at the environmental footprint, which is, which is much smaller than looking at a, a 2000 acre um, solar project. So our intent was to make this an easy process um, and the reason that we have hybrid and the other types um, is to make it really easy that if you've already developed a solar project to then add on with renewable energy, that's not considered a modification. Um, and so it really is an easy process. And if folks are out there and considering energy storage and you have questions because we are already almost halfway through, we would really uh, be happy to have uh, a conversation with you about developing that project. Um, we just, right now, as Amber mentioned before, we only have uh, one or two energy storage projects too. Um, and so we were anticipating that we would have more by this point. The regulation's been on the books now for almost a year and a half. So um, we're happy to answer any, any, any questions that you might have um, offline from this webinar. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview of those hybrid projects. Um, again, reference slide, something to take a look at when you're considering this. Um, you can see that there are different um, megawatt capacities for different types of renewable energy projects, solar and wind 150, water, geothermal 100. Of course, we're not seeing a lot outside of solar at this point, but just for future reference. Next slide, please. When you do have a hybrid project, we only want one application for that project. Um, it's combining the other renewable energy type, say solar, 
Um, and when you submit that application, you're basically just putting together the overlapping pieces, uh, mitigation plan, site plan, public participation, that sort of thing. Next slide, please. Um, Susan touched on you know, modifications and retrofits. Um, if you have an existing renewable energy project and you put in energy storage within that footprint, we're not looking at that as a modification. We're looking at that as a, as a, as a retrofit. So you know, pay attention to the terminology. They are defined in the regulations um, and there are fees associated with certain activities. So just wanted to point that out and make you aware. Next slide, please. I threw this in there as a, it's really hard to read, I apologize. Um, it's when you get your permit, there are there is a section with follow-up submissions and notifications that we want you to keep in mind. Um, you know, sometimes we do not get a final interconnection agreement with a permit. So that's something that needs to come as soon as, you know, well, let's see, we have as, uh, as soon as practicable um, for solar and within 60 days, of execution for uh, storage. So you can see for each of these, some of, not all of them, but some of them have different requirements regarding timeframes of when these submissions and notifications need to happen. Um, just wanna make you aware of that. And that was really all I wanted to do was make you aware of that. And just know that, you know, once you get your permit, you're not, you're not finished with us. There's still some pieces to come back like the, the site map for the final construction and things of that nature. And as you can see in the last two bullet points, um, this information I believe is not addressed in the regulation, but it is addressed in your PBR authorization letter. We do need to know when you commence construction and we do need to know when you commence operation. Those are very uh, two very important key pieces of data. And as I mentioned, this data is used <clears throat> by a lot of different sources. And so, um, I mean, we have a little disclaimer on our website that, um, you know, the information that we have listed is only what uh, you know, that we've been um, provided with. So um, it, it would behoove everyone to, you know, if you have forgotten to do that, once again, there is no compliance or enforcement with that, but it helps us to have good record keeping of where we are um, as a state with the development of solar and um, being able to track those milestones. Next slide, please. So what do we anticipate in the PBR process? Next slide. Just a general overview for the section 30, the more involved permits. You know, we get our NOI, we get, we are highly strongly encouraging pre-application meetings. They don't always happen, but we do find that when it does occur, the transition or the, the process is a lot smoother. And I'll go into that a little bit in a minute. Um, application submittal, this is after all the local government approvals and the 30 day public comment period. Then we have the 90 day review by DEQ and our sister agencies. Uh, typically, and I'll go into this a little bit, the sister agencies take those first 30 days and get back to us with any comments on the permit that they see. Um, and we expand on that and let you know if more information is needed. And then we have the permit authorization letter. Next slide, please. So pre-application meetings, again, like highlighting, strongly encouraged. Um, DEQ, Susan and I will coordinate an informal meeting. Um, it's off the books. We're not holding you to anything at this point um, to meet with the sister agencies and talk about the natural resource studies and findings, potential mitigation that's out there, site plans and design layout, et cetera. It's most effective to get these meetings in in the early stages. Next slide, please. So after the application submitted, what you know, what are we, what's happening? Um, basically, that's the time when the application should be complete when you send it to us. Um, this is not the time for negotiating components of the application. We get a lot of applications that the mitigation is not ready, so to speak. It's not complete. Um, we don't want to do that during these ninety days. We want these ninety days to just basically get through the review and say, yeah, great, it's good to go and here's your permit. Um, I mentioned a second ago, within 30 days, we DEQ receives comments from the sister agencies. They come back to us talking about, you know, were there threatened and endangered species on the site? Were the Virginia Land Registry and eligible historic resources on the site? And if they are, are they being addressed appropriately in the mitigation, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. 
Um, so, you know, if any documentation in, according, in accordance with those 15 application requirements are not submitted, the application is deemed incomplete. Um, we get absence of interconnection studies. We get, we are without local government certifications. You know, the site map requirement requirements are not met. It could be a host of any, uh, things, a lot of things. Um, if we don't have all those documents in hand, we're basically deeming it incomplete and we're returning that to you or to the applicant with a deficiency letter. And you can read about the deficiency letter in the regulation citation there. Next slide, please. So that letter, we issue it and within 60 days of receiving a revised application from the applicant, DEQ will determine if the application is complete and move forward with the permit authorization letter if appropriate. So you can have as much, basically as it's written right now, you have as much time as you need to get whatever it is um, that we found to be deficient into, you know, to address it. And then you come back to us, present it, and then we have 60 days from that point to do what we do in the regular 90 day session. Next slide, please. Practical tips, navigating the PBR. Next slide, please. Provide a summary document. We always get a summary document, but some people might be new to this process. Um, attach each of the 15 application requirements as appendices, summarize it in the summary document, but also give us the 15 pieces. We want, for example, a mitigation plan that's a severable document. We are, when you have an operating plan and a mitigation plan, you are by definition in the regulations, adding the mitigation plan as an addendum to the operating plan. So you can't do that when it's in a summary document. Well, you can, but it's really difficult to read. So this is to make it easier for everybody. Um, next slide, please. And this is kind of just, we don't really see a lot of local governing body certifications come in that are off point. Um, but I just wanted to put in there, you know, make sure that including the name of the project and the owner, specific location. We want to make sure that the local governing body is aware of what they're approving for um, meeting land use ordinance requirements. Next, national, national ambient air quality standards. That's an air quality thing. And we just recommend using that avert tool from EPA to address that. It's pretty simple. Blurb in the application summary. Um, and then a quick attachment as well. That's not terribly detailed. Um, next slide, please. Where we run into a lot of um, issues is the natural resources analyses, the desktop studies. A lot of times we find that the applicant stops at the desktop study, regardless of what they find, and they make an assumption on their own that, okay, so there was a threatened and endangered species a half mile away. We're not actually disturbing that site, so we don't need mitigation. But what we really need is for the applicant to coordinate with DWR in the case of a threatened and endangered species or if, and DCR. Um, if it's a historic resource, we need to make sure you, you know it's not a visual impact. And so you need to, again, coordinate with these sister agencies prior to submitting your mitigation plan, prior to submitting your application. Um, just want to emphasize that. Next slide, please. We're running out of time. <laughs> Let's see. Um, mitigation plan, just again, I think I might have talked about the mitigation plan once before. Um, must clearly address that what the significant adverse impacts are. And that's a defined term again in the regulation. Um, we want to see, we want to see in the plan, maybe not. Well, yeah, you could put it in a bullet point. You know, this is this is the resource. This is what we're doing to protect it. This is why it's not going to have a significant adverse impact. We want to be very specific in this plan so that somebody can pick it up off the street and say, oh, here's 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 what we need to, or here's what they need to be doing, and are they doing it? Um, stating that the project is too far in the design phase to incorporate mitigation is not an acceptable answer for us. Um, we are expecting the, the applicants to do their due diligence and do all of these things up front and not, again, use that 90-day period as a time for negotiating mitigation. And then the operating plan clearly describe how the project will be operated in compliance with the mitigation plan. You can read about that in the reg. I did not cite it, but 
I can, if anyone has questions on that, I can help you find it. Next slide, please. Um, site plan, please use section 70 of the corresponding regulation to know what's required for that. Um, it's, it is spelled out pretty, pretty well. Um, if you have questions, obviously feel free to call us or email us or what have you. Um, there are two parts to a site plan. We have the part with the application, initial application submittal, you know, the, the project. And then once the project is finished, we get a plan again, showing it as built. Context map, same thing. Look at that section 70 of the corresponding uh, regulation. If you have, um, if you're in the coastal avian protection zone, which is we refer to as CAPS, if you're not anywhere near that CAPS, please put a note on your site plan saying, saying as such. Uh, we just need to know that you actually did the review for it. Um, environmental permits, we wanna ensure the certification acknowledges federal, state, and local environmental permit authorizations. So we're looking at erosion and stormwater, Chesapeake Bay preservation area requirements, wetlands, et cetera. Next slide, please. Tips, identify as early as possible. I think I said this at least 10 times. As early as possible, any threatened and endangered species and or historic resources that may suffer significant adverse impacts. Ideally, the project site design doesn't even start until we know where these things are. I know everybody has a deadline and a timeline, but this could stop the process of the permit getting authorized. So just get it done before you come to us with that application. Um, we'll go to the next slide, please. Mitigation plan. I won't go over this slide because I feel like I've talked about it <laughs> enough to get the point across, but you can, when you get the copy, you can go back and look through it. Um, site plans, please identify strike, or sorry, next slide. Please identify um, stream crossings in a site plan when, especially at a pre-application meeting and at the time when you submit the application, if there is an endangered species in and around that area, we wanna know, especially if it's a fish or a mussel, we wanna know if it's gonna impact it and how. Next slide, please. Environmental permit certification. I think we just, we talked about that too. Um, if you don't have the permit yet, that is, that we're looking for, um, provide documentation to us in the application that contact has been made with the permitting authority um, regarding the, and if, you know, if it's a pending application, just let us know that too. We just wanna make sure y'all are addressing all of these things and if, you know, to make it go as seamlessly as possible. Public comment report, ensure the projects met all the specific date requirements regarding the public notice and meeting dates. If you get, if you have a public meeting and nobody shows up and you get no, information, nobody's commented at all in writing or otherwise, please put that in the application. We just don't wanna be left guessing. We just wanna make sure we have everything in place. And with that, I, I'm gonna hand it over to Susan. Thank you, Amber. She left me one minute to cover a lot of topics. <laughs> but what that says is that <laughs> uh, the PBR uh, program is, is uh, even though it is prescriptive, um, there are a lot of components to it. And I hope that Amber was able to reinforce to you that, um, I mean, the question that we get asked frequently is, um, what do you see as things that cause um, a permit application to be delayed? And quite frankly, um, it's, it's a prescribed program. There are 15 components. Um, we should really just be reviewing those when you submit an application to make sure that you've complied with all those. But a lot of times, as Amber indicated, um, there, it's sort of like that that's being used as an opportunity for negotiation. And the thing about it is, is that um, there are a lot of things coming down the pike with bats and some other things. And that um, it might be that if, if mitigation and you haven't reached concurrence with the sister agencies before you submit your application, um, there could be changes to your site plan. And so I know nobody wants that. Um, so just a little, a little plug for that. Real quickly, developments. Um, everyone is probably aware of House Bill 206 um, that was passed in the 2022 session. Um, if you want to go back um, several slides, there you go. Yes. Um, I'm not going to read this. This is just general information about House Bill 206, but I've been receiving questions, and you can go to the next slide, B, if you don't mind. Um, questions about where we are in the process now with HB 206. So we um, uh, you know, the 717 page report went to the governor and the General Assembly. 
um, a lot of different um, uh, ideas in there. Um, now we're getting down to the time where we need to begin the regulatory development process. This regulation has to be adopted by December 24 of 2024, which sounds like a lot of time, but given the regulatory process, it can take 18 months for regulation to go through. And of course, this would be an amendment to the solar regulation only. This doesn't involve any of the other um, renewable energy programs such as wind, it's just solar only. Um, I've given you some information there that we're getting ready to submit our NOIRA, which is the Notice of Intended Regulatory Action. There will be a 30-day public comment period. Um, if you want to follow that, make sure that you sign up on town hall um, to be notified of um, any actions with that. Uh, we'll also be, um, there was a, a really large task force, the first go around. It's going to be much reduced and scaled back um, for regulatory development. At this point, there will be um, a, a lot of subject matter experts where we will be discussing what mitigation is going to look like um, for the uh, prime uh, soils and farmland components of that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's see. One thing that I wanted to share with everyone, because this is new, <clears throat> and this will have impacts to everyone, not just in the Renewable Energy Program, but for any permits that you um, seek through the Department of Environmental Quality, and also with um, any other state agencies across the Commonwealth. Um, it's an initiative, um, <clears throat> the acronym is PEEP, um, and it stands for Permitting Enhancement and Evaluation Platform. Um, so DEQ was the um, pilot program for PEEP. It's a web-based application. It was uh, launched in December of 2022. If you go out to DEQ's website, you will, um, I think it's under Get Involved. It's the navigation tab all the way to the right. If you pull that down, you'll see a tab that says PEEP and you can um, take a look at that. Right now, I think there are two of our programs that have been integrated into PEEP. Um, renewable energy is uh, scheduled to uh, be online in the third quarter of 2023. So what is PEEP? Well, the intention of PEEP was to bring transparency to our permitting processes. It's going to provide information and critical steps about where the permit is uh, or application throughout its entire life cycle. Um, so it is going to show uh, basically, you know, if, if DEQ, if, if, if we're working on the application, it's gonna reflect that it's DEQ. If we've requested additional information from the applicant, it's gonna reflect that. And then you'll see that there are, if you take a look at PEEP, that there are timelines that show the overall um, regulatory guidelines or the process time for the project and where it is within that. Um, the other thing that it will do is, um, next slide please, I'm sorry. Um, there are some other things in there that will, um, uh, it will identify who the responsible parties are, and there will be notifications um, that are sent out to every party involved in the application process, um, and the general public can follow that, that process throughout the entire life cycle. Next slide, please. Um, won't go too much into this because we're short on time, but you can kind of see um, who the responsible parties are. Um, and um, let's see, what do I have here? Da, 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 yes, so I won't go into any of that. You can look at that and if you have questions, you can contact us. Um, next slide, please. This is just a quick flow chart and some of these things may not be 100% accurate, but it does show you the overall uh, process um, that we go through to permit um, a renewable energy project. So I thought that might be a little bit helpful for folks. Um, and then at the end, um, the, we have just some other slides that we don't really need to go into, but we put them out there as informational. Um, there's some good information about Pollinator Smart. Um, Foxhound Solar just got certified gold. Um, so we're really happy about that. Um, you can take a look at that information. Um, I did see a few questions that I thought I would address real quickly. Um, I think we talked about the, um, the State Corporation Commission um, there was a, a question about gin tie lines and, and whatnot. Those are um, permitted, that's outside the purview of our program. So that would be permitted through the State Corporation Commission. So you could still permit your project through the renewable energy PBR process, but your gen tie permitting would have to be done through the State Corporation Commission. Um, as someone asked, oh no, we, are, we answered that one. Well, applicants 
will applications remain accessible through PEEP after they are complete? Um, Skylar, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, that's something I will have to find out. We haven't been integrated into that yet, so I am not really sure um, about that. And when you say access to the application, what you're really getting access to is um, just um, dates and time, like events associated with the process. Um, so you're not really um, like seeing the application itself. It's just the process around it. So um, with that, I will turn it over back over to Brad and Bob. I don't know if we have any time for questions. We're already six minutes over. So yeah. Amber and I have nowhere to go. So that's up to you gentlemen. Well, I think, you know, just keep us on time. Uh, you know, any, any additional questions that we didn't have time for, we'll respond by email. So uh, I want to thank Amber and Susan for coming today. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you, Bob, for joining us. Uh, so if you have any other questions, feel free to join us or feel free to email us at energy at williamsmullen.com or contact us using the contact information on your screen. And thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar on May 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Susan. Thanks, Amber. Thanks, Bradley. Thank you.